Good afternoon. My name is Shiel Kohli. I'm the Head of Corporate Communications uh, in Asia Pacific for Credit Suisse. Uh, it's a great privilege today to be able to welcome you to this uh, luncheon keynote address. It is the last luncheon keynote address of the Credit Suisse Asian Investment Conference. Um, now, uh, without further delay, I'd like to return to our guest speaker for this afternoon. Uh, he is an award-winning behavioral economist. He's uh, a BBC radio and television presenter. He's also a Financial Times columnist and uh, an accomplished author. His latest book is entitled The Undercover Economist Strikes Back. And it was described by the New Statesman magazine as the holy grail of popular economics. Uh, Tim Harford is widely recognized as a compelling storyteller on the topics of economics, psychology, and management. And he has that uh, fantastic knack of being able to convey rather complex, sometimes staid and dull economics ideas with a rather witty and uh, slightly irreverent touch too. He's won numerous awards for journalism. He was named one of the top three economics commentators in the United Kingdom by editorial intelligence. And he was also named as one of the UK's top 20 tweeters <laughs> by the independent newspaper. So he likes sharing his opinions. He was educated at Oxford University in the United Kingdom. He's now based in Oxford. Uh, Tim previously worked as an economist at Shell and at the World Bank. Uh, He's a member of the FT's editorial board and currently a visiting fellow at Nuffield College, Oxford, uh, and a member of the Royal Economic Society Council. I think it's very fitting that we have Tim with us today. I think most of the discussions on the outlook of the global economy are rather influenced by what went wrong during the financial crisis. Um, and Tim is going to be speaking to us today about the, the importance of learning from our past mistakes. Clearly, if we had done this, we may have avoided the crisis. Maybe not. And I, perhaps more interestingly, I wonder what potentially the errors we are making right now that we are perhaps unwittingly aware of that we should seek to avoid so that we can prevent another crisis in the future. I hope that Tim can share some of those, some, some insights into us to help us answer those questions. So please join me in welcoming Tim Harford. Thanks, Nick. Well, thank you very much, Sheil. Um, it's a very, very generous introduction. I, I can't wait to hear what I've got to say. It sounds like it's going to be brilliant. <laughs> um, so my, my, my topic... Uh, for today is, uh, is mistakes and why we make them and what we can learn from them. And, and I wanted to, to start um, with a mistake that was made by, by this lady. Her name is Twyla Tharp. And she's, she's not a business person. She's, she's not in finance. She's a choreographer. She does ballet cont and contemporary dance. And she's tremendously successful. She's, she's won all kinds of awards. She has... Uh, She's worked with everybody from Mikhail Baryshnikov to Milos Forman, who directed Amadeus, to, to Philip Glass, uh, to Bob Dylan. And uh, she came up with the idea about 12 years ago of doing a totally different kind of musical. It was going to be part ballet, it was going to be part rock concert, uh, part musical theatre, part conventional theatre. There was going to be a rock band on stage, but also the very highest quality contemporary dancers. And it was going to be based on the songwriting of Billy Joel, very, very popular American, uh, you know, middle-of-the-road rock musician. He wrote Piano Man and Uptown Girl. And this, this sort of intellectual, cerebral choreographer was going to uh, choreograph dances to the music of Billy Joel. And the whole thing was going to be called Moving Out. So she sold the idea to investors. She sold the idea to Billy Joel. He handed over control of all his music to her. 
She directed, she choreographed, she produced. Everything lay in her lap, under her control. And she then uh, put the show on in the Schubert Theatre in Chicago. And it was terrible. <laughs> Absolutely, shockingly awful. <laughs> so, <laughs> the reviews that, that were published the next day by the Chicago press said it was, it was you know, embarrassingly naive, it was confusing, it was, it was, it was just, there were, there were bits where half of the audience turned to the other half of the audience and said, what just happened? Who just died? Huh? Uh, uh, somebody said it, it was as silly as anything in the movie Reefer Madness. And I can assure you the movie Reefer Madness is a very, very silly movie. I mean, suffice it to say, it was not a critical success. And all of this, all of the blame, was placed squarely on Twyla Tharp. It was her idea. She was in charge of everything. The, the finance, the design, the, the, the dance, everything. It was her fault. To make matters worse, the whole business in Chicago was supposed to be a trial run for traveling to New York. This show was going to be on Broadway. There was real money involved. And normally, the idea is that you, you try out your show uh, in somewhere like Chicago or Philadelphia, you work out the, the small mistakes, the tiny little errors, you fix them, then you arrive on Broadway. And the agreement is, the local press will review your show, but um, the New York press won't. The New York press won't touch it until you get to Broadway. But in this particular case, um, Billy Joel was so famous, and the show was so terrible, <laughs> that the New York media just couldn't resist the opportunity to write about the fact that this gigantic turkey was flapping its way from Chicago <laughs> all the way to New York. And so the New York newspaper Newsday republished the juiciest review from Chicago to just let everybody in Manhattan know what was coming to them. Well, the argument I want to make today is that we should, all of us, do more of what Twyla Tharp did. We should all of us expose ourselves to the, to the same um, cripplingly embarrassing, publicly humiliating, career-destroying <laughs> risks of failure that Twyla did. And uh, I realize that may be a hard sell, so <laughs> I'd, <laughs> I'd better see how convincing I can be. I mean, the, the reason why I think we should think more about mistakes and be willing to make mistakes is actually something that a lot of people pay lip service to. So there's this idea in Silicon Valley that uh, you're going to fail anyway, so fail quickly. You know, fail forward, learn from your mistakes. You experiment, you try things out, you learn, you move on. And this, this is quite a popular idea. I, I, I hear it everywhere. And that, that idea makes a lot of sense. The world is an incredibly complicated place. So according to one estimate that I find plausible, in Hong Kong alone, there are approximately 10 billion, that's 10,000 million, distinct products and services on sale. Absolutely astonishing economic complexity. And that's just the barcodes, that's just the products. And then you think about all the people, seven billion people on the planet, all the social interactions, the psychology, the sociology, the politics, the culture, the, the environmental impacts of what we do. The world is just an unbelievably complex place. And we don't have the cognitive capacity, we don't have the brains to deal with all of this complexity. And so there is no way that you can just sit, sit down with um, a, an Excel spreadsheet and figure it all out. Uh, in your armchair. You, you're going to have to try a few things out, see whether they work, adjust, adapt, a bit of trial and error. And I think a lot, a lot of people, they, they accept this in principle. They like the idea of this. I, I gave a talk um, a couple of years ago to uh, supply chain managers in um, Disneyland. 
It was a great place to give a talk. Um, and that one of the, there was a talk to all of these supply chain managers from one of the grand old men of Disney. He had worked with Walt Disney himself. He was this great creative force. And he, he said to all of these supply chain managers, if you don't fail in 50% of the things that you're doing, you're, you're not trying hard enough, you're not being original enough, you're not testing yourself enough, you're not being creative enough. And all of these people, they all, they all nodded, they all said, yes, we agree, yes, yeah. We should fail in 50% of what we do. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I stood up afterwards and I said, I completely agree with what this gentleman just said, but are you really all going to go back to your offices on Monday and start failing at half the things you do? You all nodded, you all agreed, but you, you, are you, do you really think that? And my experience is that people like the idea of trial and error, they like the idea of experimentation, um, they like this, the Silicon Valley mentality, they like the, the idea that um, creative people fail a lot, that science progresses through failed hypotheses, everybody, everybody likes this, but actually when it comes down to it, it's tremendously difficult to put it into action. And so, really what I want to talk about is three different reasons why we find it hard to fail in a productive way, why we find it hard to experiment safely and to learn from those experiments and to, to learn from the failures in a way that turns them into to local, to, to, to later successes. So th three obstacles to productive failure. And the first obstacle is really to do with group psychology, the way we behave when there are several of us together in a room. Now, this is based on the research of a psychologist called Solomon Ash. Uh, I, I was going to, um, to discuss Solomon Ash's experiment with you, but I recently discovered something rather wonderful, which is that uh, about 50 years ago, Solomon Ash worked with uh, the television company who produced Candid Camera. And that means that instead of talking to you about Solomon Ash, I can just show you a two-minute film. So I'm, I'm just going to do that now. The gentleman in the elevator now is a candid star. These folks who are entering, the man with the white shirt, the lady with the trench coat, and subsequently one other member of our staff will face the rear. And you'll see how this man in the trench coat <laughs> maintain his individuality, <laughs> but little by little, <laughs> he looks at his watch, but he's really making an excuse for turning just a little bit more <laughs> to the wall. Now we'll try it once again. Here's the candid subject. Here comes the candid camera staff, three of them at least. <laughs> And uh, this man has apparently been in group. <laughs> Here's a fella with his hat on in the elevator. First he makes a full turn to the rear and Charlie closes the door. A moment later, we'll open the door. Everybody's changed positions. <laughs> now we'll see if we can use Now we'll see if we can use group pressure for some good. Now in a moment, on Charlie's signal, everybody turns forward. Very notice, they take off their hats. And now, do you think we could reverse the procedure? Watch. So Solomon Ash was fascinated by this problem of conformity. You know, what, what we do when everybody around us uh, agrees with each other. And his most famous experiment was done in the late 1950s. Uh, he, he lined up uh, a bunch of people and he, he showed them two cards. 
So one card had a, a single line on it, and the other card had three lines, uh, different lengths, labeled A, B, and C. And the question was very simple. Which of these three lines, A, B, and C, is the same length as this reference line? It's not a hard problem. You, know, you, you look, you can see, uh, it's pretty clear. And so imagine that the answer is, is B. And so then Solomon Ash goes down the line and asks people what they think the answer is. And the answer is clearly B. A, 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 A. All the way down the line, everyone's saying A. Now there's some guy towards the end of the line who is now feeling very strange. He was that, that first guy in the, in, in the elevator who was looking at his watch and who, you know, he, you know, this person is now giggling, muttering under his breath. Uh, he, he's nervous. Uh, he's under pressure because he, he can see the answers B, but everyone's saying A. So what's, it, it doesn't make any sense. Now, of course, you've seen the candid camera video, so you know what's going on. All of these people are working for the experimenter. They're all working for Solomon Ash. They've all been told to say A. It's only this poor guy at the end of the line who's actually being experimented on. And we have to see, what, what does he do? He can see the answers B, everybody said A, gets to him. Very often, that person will also say A. He will fit in with the crowd. And uh, there was a debrief after these experiments. That, so they asked these people, well, why did, you, why did you say A? And there was an interesting split. About half of them said, well, um, I, I thought the answer was B. But th when I saw that everybody in the room thought the answer was A, I, I realized I must be wrong, and I changed my mind. And the other half said, well, I knew the answer was B, I could see the answer was B, I don't know what those guys were taking, but I didn't want to say something different, I didn't want to cause a fuss. I didn't want, you know, just, who cares, whatever. I'll just say, whatever you guys are saying, I'll just say it, whatever, just anything for a quiet life. And both of these motivations are quite simple, they're, they're quite easy to understand. Um, but now think about making a real business decision, a, a trading strategy, a, 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 a product launch, a policy, a political policy. You, you gather together with your colleagues, and now it's, it's never clear whether the right answer is A, B, or C. The world is complicated. It's never obvious what the right answer is. And the stakes are so much higher. You're not just in an experimental uh, suite with a bunch of total strangers you're never going to see again. You're with your colleagues. You, your reputation depends on your answers. Your, your salary, your prospects for promotion depend on your answers. And so the pressures for conformity are even greater. You, it's really hard to be the person who says B when everybody else is saying A. And yet, that is a clear obstacle to a really productive, experimental, trial and error approach. If everybody in the room comes in and says, well, we all agreed that strategy A was the right strategy, who is going to be the person who says, maybe we should try B, maybe just a little bit of B, maybe just a, at a small scale, maybe just at a pilot, let's just investigate. It, it's almost impossible to be that person who, who does that in the face of complete conformity. Now, the, the encouraging thing is, it's actually not that difficult to break this spell of conformity. It's, no, it's not hard to, to get people to think in a different way. So one of the follow-up experiments Solomon Ash did was to, uh, same thing, showed them the cards, the answers still be, there's still a bunch of stooges, they're all working for Solomon Ash, but now we go down the line, um, and the answer is, is A, 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 B. A, 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 A. We get to the person at the end of the line. Now, now we realize it's not a popularity contest. You, you know the answer's B. You believe the answer's B. Everybody said A, except this one gentleman here who, who seems to understand the way the world is. And that's enough. Just one person saying the correct answer is enough to free people from this magic of conformity and to say, well, I think the answer's B too. I agree with him. In fact, it, it takes even less than that. So in another run of the experiment, Solomon Ash, you go down the same setup, everything, A, 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 C, A, 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 A. Now nobody in the room has said the right thing. There's one person in the room who said a different wrong thing. <laughs> and that's enough. That's enough for people to stand up and say, well, I, say, I think B as well. 
No one agrees with me, but at least there is one other person who's willing to be different. That even if you do nothing for the rest of your careers, but go to meetings and say the wrong thing, <laughs> as long as it's a different wrong thing from what everybody else is saying, you, <clears throat> you're, you're adding value to the conversation because <laughs> there, might be, there might be somebody else in the room, somebody who actually has a genuinely good idea. <laughs> it's always possible. Uh, and that person isn't willing to speak up because everybody seems to be in agreement. Uh, I mean, how do we, how do we operationalize this? It, I don't think it's tremendously hard. We just need to be conscious of the problem. So um, President Kennedy commissioned a psychologist, Irving Janis, to examine his decision-making uh, procedure after um, his administration had made just a colossal mess of one of its first foreign policy challenges. Um, a room full of incredibly smart people had done a very, very stupid thing with respect to uh, invading Cuba, basically. Um, and it was, it, this was never going to work, and it was obvious it was never going to work, and yet somehow nobody in the room had put their hand up and said, this is, this is stupid, we should stop. And so he invited the psychologist Irving Janis to examine decision-making, and Janis was the person who coined the word groupthink. And Janice gave them advice, and, and they changed their approach. And the new approach is very simple to understand. Just demand disagreement. Split groups up. Ask one group to work on one view of the world. Ask a second group to work on a different opposing view of the world. Get them back together. Bring in an external expert and brief that external expert. They have to disagree with the group. Just anything to break the spell of conformity. So that's, that's the number one obstacle to productive experimentation and the solution. So let me give you the second obstacle. Um, this is a picture of something called a play pump. I used to work for the World Bank. We got very excited by this. Um, the, the idea is you, you have a traditional hand pump. You pump fresh water in Africa, and what you do is you get rid of the hand pump and you replace it with this children's uh, roundabout. And the children play on the roundabout, and they pump fresh water as they play. And it goes into, you see this yellow thing in the back, the yellow thing in the back, that's a water tank, and it's got advertising on it, I think, from Procter & Gamble. And um, so the advertising pays for everything. You've got fresh water in the tank. And then when the women of the community, because it always is the women, when the women of the community come to get fresh water, they don't have to pump with a hand pump. They just turn on a tap. The water's already there. And the children get something to play on. It's, it's great. It's paid for by the advertising. Brilliant idea. So I got very excited about this, and I put it on the, my blog at the World Bank, and um, you know, various pop stars and rappers got excited, and Laura Bush got excited. Laura Bush is not a rock star, by the way. She's a <laughs> wife of the former president of the United States, just to be clear. Um, and <clears throat> and, and this, this was great. And then the idea uh, came. So this started in South Africa, in the South African townships, like uh, Johannesburg. Um, then um, the idea came, well, why don't we try it in Malawi? Well, Malawi is another African country, but it's, it's poorer than South Africa, and it's also um, less densely populated. So now you can't afford to pay for this thing with advertising. No advertiser will pay to reach a Malawian village. But that's okay, because we have donors, we have very generous people, we'll pay for these play pumps. And so, you know, the, the charity would come in, they'd take out the hand pump, they'd install the play pump, and they'd go away. Well, that's great. I mean, I, I think that this sort of experimentation is, is very useful, and this may work really well. But the, the fundamental question is, does it work? How are you going to know if it works? Because all these donors were sitting in Washington, D.C. or New York, and all the play pumps were sitting in villages in Malawi. And there was just no feedback at all. There's no phone number the Malawian villages can, can, can dial to say, that, tell, uh, we wanted to tell you how the play pump's working. And, and the, the charities would send photographers, and the photographers would take photographs like this. Because when, when the guy, you know, the white guy with a camera comes, all the kids jump on the merry-go-round, and they all go round and round and round, and you take the photographs, they're happy, everything looks great. And, you take the photo, you take it to the donors, but that doesn't tell you whether the thing worked. And it turns out, actually, these things didn't work. And they didn't work for a very simple reason. There weren't enough children. And so the water tanks were always empty. 
And so when the women wanted to pump water, they had to actually physically pump water with this <laughs> merry-go-round. It's, it's not very efficient. And they had to pump it all the way into the tank and all the way down again. And this was finally spotted uh, by a Canadian engineer who, who was living in uh, Malawi. And he didn't need to be an engineer. That wasn't the vital skill. He just needed two things. One, he needed to be there. And two, he needed to have a video camera and a blog. That's all it took. And the, the blog posts went viral. And suddenly we understood this wasn't a very good idea. And I, the problem was fixed. But I don't think we, we pay nearly enough attention to this question of feedback, this question of this new experiment, is it working or is it not working? And that's something I always try and encourage people to do, just to think about what are the feedback mechanisms in your organization. They can be very formal and quantitative. You can run a randomized controlled trial, and that can tell you whether you're doing the right thing. Or they can be much more informal. Your colleagues can tap you on the shoulder and say, you know what, you're an idiot. <laughs> Stop doing it. But actually, we, we, we rarely give these things really conscious thought. And, and my tip for better feedback is, is quite a simple one. I mean, there are lots of, there's been the whole books written about this, but it's quite a simple one. Forget about positive or negative feedback. Positive or negative feedback is not a, is not a helpful thing. Let's always think about specific feedback. Specific feedback. What is the thing that needs to change? I've been reading recently about the, uh, the movie company Pixar, who created Toy Story and Wall-E and Cars and all these great films. And in their creative process, which is full of trial and error, they're very focused on this idea of specific feedback. Don't tell me that something is good or bad. Tell me something specific that will help me improve it. Surprising how rare we actually, how rarely we actually ask for specific feedback, and it's surprisingly how rarely we give it. So that's the second obstacle to productive experimentation. And the third obstacle is maybe the most important of all, because the third obstacle is up here. It's all about the way we think, and it's all about the way we react when we have failed. Um, this, um, this man is called Noel Edmonds. Um, he's a game show host, and he's a game show host of a, a show called Deal or No Deal. Uh, and Deal No Deal is syndicated across the world, about 50 different countries. It originally came from the Netherlands. We can blame the Dutch for Deal or No Deal. And Deal or No Deal is fascinating because um, people play this game show. There's quite a lot of money at stake. And they, they get to, you can watch people playing all over the world the same rules, the same stakes. And you can see how people behave under a situation of risk. And the way the game works is, uh, the, the contestant has a box, and in the box, there's a certain amount of money. So it might be um, uh, one penny, or 50 pence, or 100,000 pounds, or 500,000 pounds, uh, 500,000 dollars, 500,000 euros, um, it depend, obviously depending on where the game is being played. Um, and the, the amount of money in the box is roughly doubling each time. So most of the boxes have nothing in, or very small amounts of money in, but a few boxes have you know, $75,000, $150,000, $250,000, real money. Um, so the contestant has one of these boxes. All the other boxes are out there in the studio, and the contestant will pick a box, and it will be opened and discarded. So if you pick a box, and they open the box and say, oh, it's got $5 in, that's great. It means your box doesn't have $5 in. But if you pick a box, and they open the box, and it's got $250,000 in. Well, that's a problem, because it means your box does not have $250,000 in. And it would be nice if your box did have $250,000 in. So you're picking these boxes, and they're being discarded. You're eliminating boxes one by one. And then every now and then, the, this telephone rings. And on the other end of the telephone is a mysterious man called the banker. And the banker, this is where people get their conception of what banking is like, by the way. <laughs> Daytime television. And the banker offers uh, money to quit the game. You know, the banker doesn't know how much money is in your box. You, the player, you don't know how much money is in your box. But the banker can see the boxes that have been discarded and will make you an offer. And, and that's the offer that gives the game its name, deal or no deal. 
And so the fascinating thing about deal or no deal is we get to see how people make these decisions in a, in a situation of risk. So let me tell you about one particular player. His name was Frank. He was Dutch. And he'd, he'd discarded a bunch of boxes. There were five boxes left. And one of the boxes had half a million euros in it. And the other boxes had pretty much nothing. So half a million euros divided by five, uh, it's about 100,000 euros. He, he stands to win 100,000 euros. But it's a very skewed distribution. And the banker phones up and says, I will give you 85,000 euros to quit. And Frank thinks about it, and then Frank says no. He wants to keep gambling. Okay. He then opens another box, and that box contains 500,000 euros. Bye-bye. And the banker then phones him back and says, thanks very much for the bailout. Uh, my new offer is 2,500 euros. He's going to get 85,000 euros, 87,000 euros. Now he's going to get 2,500 euros. And if Frank was thinking completely rationally, he would say, OK, I made a mistake, but that money's gone. Actually, the new offer of 2,500 euros is actually quite a good offer relative to what's left in the game. It's a better offer in some ways than the, the original offer. Um, I should take it very seriously. But Frank was not thinking totally rationally. He wasn't thinking forward. He was thinking backward. He was thinking two things. Number one, I hate the banker. <laughs> <laughs> and number two, I hate myself. I hate myself for that stupid thing I just did. And he was so busy thinking about the loss that he just made he couldn't think about the opportunity, about the decision that lay in front of him. And he said no. And the next offer from the banker was actually worth more than the fair value of, of playing the game. And Frank said no. And the final offer, he, two boxes left, 10,000 euros or 10 euros. And the banker offers 6,000 euros to stop. And Frank says no. And Frank leaves the studio with 10 euros. <laughs> now, here's the interesting thing. It turns out that that behavior is statistically typical. That is how we play deal or no deal. There is also research from the finance professor, Terence O'Dean, that says that is how investors behave. Yeah, I'm going to sell my Google shares. I'm going to hold on to the Lehman Brothers shares. They're going to recover soon. Because we don't want to say we don't want to say that we made a mistake in the past, and so we make a bigger mistake in the future. The same thing is true of poker players. This is just human behaviour. But if if I'm encouraging you to make positive mistakes, that's not very good advice unless we can behave in a rational way after we've made those mistakes. And so we constantly have to give this uh, take this forward thinking approach rather than looking backwards. We always have to make peace with our losses. And of course, this is something that, you know, as people in the financial community, you, you're aware of this. But I, I always have one simple piece of advice uh, when, whenever I'm, th I'm thinking about any decision, but particularly an investment, always to say, well, forget the past. Would I buy this now? If I was starting now, would this be attractive? Should I be, should I be in this relationship? Should I have these shares? Forget the past. From this point forward, should I have them? If the answer is no, you've got to ask some very serious questions about why you're still in the deal. So those are, those are the three obstacles to successful uh, mistakes. I, I think I should probably get back to Twyla Tharp for a second. Because Twyla Tharp, after she had received all these terrible, terrible reviews, sat down and decided to improve her feedback mechanism. So she had all the newspapers in front of her, all the reviews, and she sat with an old friend she'd been working with for 30 years over coffee and orange juice, and her friend looked her in the eye. It was a lighting designer called Jennifer Tipton. Her friend looked her in the eye and said, these reviews, you know they're right. That's a terribly difficult thing to say to any friend. These criticisms of you are right. 
And that was the spur, the feedback she needed to start making changes. So then she went to her manager and she said, I want, these, I want this feedback, but I want it to be less emotional. So he made an Excel spreadsheet of all the criticisms, you know, took all the personal stuff out, took all the insults out, just a point by point categorization of all the things that were wrong with this musical. And Twyla Tharp went out there with her dancers performing every night in Chicago to smaller and smaller audiences during the day, working with them with a, a fresh performance, fresh ideas, radical changes, sacking people, bringing new people in, really under tremendous personal pressure. And then a few weeks later, the play, Moving Out, opened in Broadway, and the world's media came, and the reviews were amazing. They said it was a shimmering portrait of an American generation. They said it was a smash. They said it was, it was brilliant. It won, it ran for years. It won Tony Awards. It won Tony Awards for Twyla Tharp. And the most interesting review for me was by one of the original Chicago reviewers who'd been invited to New York to reconsider his views and to, 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 to re, uh, recap his old review. And he said, this is incredible. This is the biggest change I can ever remember seeing to any play before it appeared on Broadway. He said, the question we should all be asking ourselves is, how did this happen? That's something we don't do enough. To watch somebody make a huge mistake, to watch somebody fix it, and to ask ourselves, how did that mistake get corrected? I'm absolutely convinced that's a key skill in the modern world. Not in avoiding mistakes, but in spotting them and in fixing them before they fix us. Thank you very much for listening. very much, Tim. As I was reading my speech, it kept, I kept looking at your laptop and it said, make more mistakes, and I was trying not to make mistakes. So. Um, but clearly, I should have. Um, uh, could I ask if there are any questions from the audience? So they're all scared of... We should, we should by the way, um, applaud the sound crew who had a microphone that wasn't working, and I don't know if you noticed, managed to fix that halfway through the, the whole thing. So this, this is all about adaptive error correction. This is a very, very important skill. So th thanks for helping me demonstrate this. Thank you, guys. <laughs> the gentleman over there. Thank you. I just have a uh, complimenting question. Uh, you mentioned that uh, uh, complexity is something at least in this environment uh, we are working in, uh, difficult to handle and to, to rationalize what are the opportunities and uh, where are they. But you, you didn't give us an answer. I mean, uh, if you have so many millions of opportunities, even trial and error is somehow limited, uh, unless I can grow much older. So what is your take on that, uh, to narrow down and get to at least the more promising ones? Sure. Um, there, I mean, there are, there are a couple of different ways to think about that question. Um, so one is about what are, the, what are the filters we use, what are the heuristics that we use. Uh, and th there's some very interesting research from um, psychologist Gerd Gigerenza, um, uh, who argues that actually some very simple heuristics can work very, very well in making decisions. Um, so he has, a, he has a stock market portfolio um, of, of uh, tech stocks that were chosen by wandering around Germany and asking people in the street, have you ever heard of this company? Have you ever heard of this company? Have you ever heard of this company? Then it turns out that, that just that recognition heuristic, oh yeah, I know those guys. Um, that stock portfolio outperformed 80% um, of professional stock pickers uh, in the, in the dot-com boom. And then he repeated it in the bust and it, uh, same experiment and it also worked, the ones that people had, had recognized. So sometimes these simple heuristics can help us in a way that um, sometimes we fool ourselves with more complex uh, optimizations because these, what, these things that in principle are optimal on paper, in practice, actually don't take account of the fact that our data is always limited and um, you know, we're never measuring what we think we're measuring. So that, that's one way of thinking about it. There is another way, which is from the point of view, I guess, of a regulator or a risk manager. How do we make these complex systems safe? Um, and I, I would very much recommend a book called Adapt by a guy called Tim Harford, super book. <laughs> uh, but it has a, it has a chapter on... Um, on financial uh, regulation and, this, and uh, complex systems and trying to make complex systems safer. 
And the argument I make there is that we need to learn uh, from safety engineers. <coughs> so the guys who try and prevent oil rigs blowing up or nuclear power stations melting down actually understand quite a lot about uh, complex, uh, tightly coupled, <laughs> interconnected, unpredictable systems. And some of these things have engineering solutions. Let's simplify, let's decouple. But a lot of them, these are not engineering solutions. These are human problems. They're about um, whistleblowing and how we encourage the right kind of whistleblowing and protect the right kind of whistleblower. Early warning systems, um, peer review of decisions. Um, so, um, I mean, there's a whole chapter in the book which is it's jolly good. <laughs> Um, are there any rules or lessons that you could share with us in terms of um, people who are just better able to examine their own failures? Um, I mean, not to be provocative, but you know, men versus women or people from different parts of the world? Um, so I, I, don't, I don't want to make any cultural comment, partly because I'm not a cultural expert and partly because... Uh, I keep being surprised. So I, I was recently uh, told by a psychologist that you know, people keep telling me that, oh, um, um, Japanese people are, are risk averse. That's how I keep being told. And then I was told apparently totally untrue of the Japanese education system. Students will stand up and make mistakes at the blackboard for 20 minutes, I am told. But I'm not, as I say, I'm not a cultural expert. But I mean, the, I think that there are certain professions that seem to be um, seem to be better at monitoring uh, their own risks. Meteorologists are, are often cited as, profession, as a profession that keeps looking at its forecasts, going back, checking whether the forecasts were any good, uh, calibrating how uncertain the forecasts are, um, yeah, just constantly revisiting its, its own forecasts. And meteorology has got, actually got a lot better at forecasting the weather. Um, we economists seem to struggle a lot with that. And I think that the, I think it's partly that the incentives are different. Um, it's partly that it's a tremendously complicated problem. But we, we, I, I don't often see um, people going back and revisiting uh, their own forecasts. And that's something that, that we should do as a, as a discipline. Um, and the, uh, one, one other thing I hesitate to mention because it's become almost a cliche now, but I still think it's good, is this idea of um, the, psycho the fox psychology versus the hedgehog psychology. So this, this old poem from ancient Greece, um, the fox knows many things, the hedgehog knows one big thing. Um, so do you think like a fox or do you think like a hedgehog? Do you have a, a hedgehog-like logical framework in which you process all information, you fit everything together, and you, you, you know, everything is analyzed in that framework? Or are you more like a fox where uh, you know lots of different stuff, you read different newspapers, you talk to different people, you don't really have an overarching theory, you keep changing your mind? Um, and those different thinking styles are appropriate for different situations. So Einstein was a hedgehog, and probably that's a great way to make progress in uh, theoretical physics. Um, but in social science forecasting, political forecasting, economic forecasting, the evidence now suggests, there's a very good evidence base, that the fox-like strategy of don't put all your eggs in one basket, don't rely too much on any one thinking style, don't rely too much on any one piece of advice. That strategy is, is less bad. It's not good. I mean, foxes are not good forecasters, but they're not terrible. And hedgehogs really are terrible, terrible forecasters. So we need to try and think a bit more like a fox, open our minds, and be more willing to acknowledge we don't really know. Tim, um, I'm imagining that leadership and culture within an organization um, would be critical in this, but I'm wondering if any of the studies showed whether that has a disproportionate impact, meaning that allowance of mistakes and, and that acceptance. Uh, y yes, I mean, this can, this can for sure come from management, and I think it's important to distinguish between different kinds of mistakes. So there are, there are mistakes that are not acceptable. They are, they are ethical failures, they are uh, you know, catastrophic failures of judgment, and there are mistakes that are totally acceptable. They are, you know, um, calculated risks that were you know, discussed and agreed and everybody could see that there was a big potential upside, but it didn't work out. So, um, I mean, it's not just a case of cutting people some slack when they screw up. We have to ask you know, why it is that people screwed up, what was behind the mistake, uh, whether it was a mistake that should be celebrated or tolerated or whether it was a mistake that should be a, a firing offense. 
but it, I mean, it, it, this often comes from management and it, it's a difficult tone to set because of course no one, nobody really wants to acknowledge mistakes. I was fascinated to, to, to mention Pixar again. So Pixar have made all of these films, Toy Story, Cars and so on, and every single film they made, there was some big mistake in the middle of them. There was some large change of direction that was required to do with the financing or the, the scripting or whatever, except one, Toy Story 3. Wait, I don't know if you, has anybody seen Toy Story 3? I've got, I've got kids, I love Toy Story 3. It's a great, you'll be in floods of tears. It's a great film, you should see it. Um, Toy Story 3, apparently no significant mistakes whatsoever made during the production of that film. And so when Ed Catmull, who's, who runs Pixar, mentioned this in some speech, he said, it's amazing, you know, we produced this film and we didn't really make any important mistakes. There were no meltdowns. When he got back to the office, his team were angry with him because they thought that he was saying they hadn't been creative enough, they hadn't been original enough, they hadn't tried hard enough. And he had to, he had to actually said, no, I was just saying, you know, you didn't make any mistakes. I, was, I didn't mean any criticism. And that's a culture that has really learned to embrace mistakes. When, when uh, the chief executive stands up and says, you didn't make any mistakes and people are upset, <laughs> that, you've succeeded. Um, another question? Hi, team. Uh, thank you very much for all the stories you shared today and uh, last slide. I just wonder, some people are by nature very optimistic and some are very uh, skeptical as always. Yeah. Do you see any good uh, point of uh, having a strategy of putting all these very skeptical people being the critics all the time? That's, the, that's their profession to go around different organizations or, or within the same team to keep criticizing and pointing out what's the risks and threats and also providing all these like uh, critics uh, how still how stupid their colleagues are in terms of doing things. <laughs> is, is that a good strategy or do you see any organization doing that already? Thank uh, you. So um, the, only, the only organization I'm aware of that has really institutionalized this is the Catholic Church. <laughs> <laughs> and, and unfortunately, the Catholic Church abandoned the idea about, I think about 80 years ago, and I, it, I'm not sure that decision worked out well, but the, the idea was always when, a, when somebody was going to be made into a saint, somebody was always given the job, it was called the devil's advocate. And that person would have to, to stand up and act almost as though he was representing the devil and say every bad thing that this person had, had done and every reason this person shouldn't be made a saint. And that was regarded as an essential part of the process. If you don't consider the case against, then you haven't really properly considered the case for. Unfortunately, the whole devil's advocate thing has been, uh, has been abandoned. Um, so I think that, that that can work, but let me be cautious. If it's always the same person who is the devil's advocate, it's not going to work. Because then the whole thing becomes like a ritual, uh, and this person is the person you know. You know uh, this is always the negative person. This is always the guy who's, who's kind of criticizing everybody, and so we don't need to pay attention to them. And that person becomes isolated. Uh, so there's a, there's a very, very important role for criticism, but you can't just outsource to a single person. Um, because then people learn, because criticism hurts. It hurts to give a criticism, and so if there's some way you can say, oh, it's Shield criticizing me. He doesn't count. It's, a, it's just Shield. He's always so critical. Um, it's got to come from different, different people. It's got to come in, in a different way. You've got to mix it up. Um, I mean, this diversity of different thinking styles is tremendously important, as the Solomon Ash study showed. You've got to have people who say different things. There are many, many other studies who, who, that argue that diversity in thinking styles is important. Um, so I would absolutely take advantage of the critics. But um, you know, if they become known exclusively as the critics, then they lose some of their effectiveness. One more time for one more question. Tim, sorry for a second question. What I'm dying to know, is there a correlation between ego and success? In other words, uh, if you have no ego, then uh, your success rate is higher. I've, uh, I've witnessed this very much in, in the financial industry and also among lawyers. Those lawyers who are not so ego-driven are much more successful, at least my very humble experience. Um, I, w <laughs> I would love to see that study. Uh, I, I, I'm not sure that it exists. Um, I mean, I th we, need, we need people with tremendous ego out there. 
uh, because uh, no, no sort of entrepreneur would ever get started if they didn't have a totally unrealistic view of their chance of success. You know, we would, we would never have had Microsoft, we would never have had, had Apple uh, if it wasn't for enormous egos. Um, but fortunately, when those egos are in a market context, when they make mistakes, the market bounces back and cuts them down to size. It's when you get the ego in a very, very large organization or in government that I think you really, you, you have the danger. So absolutely, we need people with stupid, stupid ideas, willing to take long shots, no fear of failure, um, but we also need mechanisms, feedback mechanisms, market mechanisms, to cut them down to size when, when they get too big. Okay. How do you actually go about implementing such cultural change of, uh, of questioning um, in, in organizations that haven't done it in the past? Uh, I think, it, like, like any organizational change, it's a tremendously slow process. Uh, I mean, if, whenever I see um, people writing articles saying, oh, we just need to change our culture, I'm like, really? Oh, just that, only the culture, <laughs> uh, no big deal. So of course it's really hard, but I think um, the signal can come from management, whether it's top management, whether it's middle management. You know, as an employee, you look to the feedback that you are getting from your boss and how your boss is responding to your mistakes um, how much responsibility your boss is giving you. You see also how, you know, the, how much responsibility the boss takes for his own mistakes or her own mistakes, how the boss is responding to your colleagues. Um, so you get a sense. Uh, people understand whether this is a place where they can challenge, where they can experiment, where they can fail or not. And management are the people who are going to be able to change that or not. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the last day of this year's Asian Investment Conference. I'd like to thank Tim Harford for finishing it. Thanks very much.